Thanks. Um, Les, Tim, Alan. Good morning, everybody. Thank you once again for this invitation to, uh, to speak to you. It's a pleasure and an honour to be here. I was here in front of some of you in uh, November last year uh, to give you uh, an update, and, I, and I'm back again, and it's a pleasure uh, to be here to do so. You have my uh, biography in your um, programme. Um, I'm five years now in Eurocopter. Um, I was ten years in Airbus, uh, in the aircraft manufacturer, before I was in Eurocopter, and before Airbus, I was a helicopter pilot um, in the military, uh, in the Royal Navy. Um, I was a search and rescue helicopter pilot in Scotland for many years, uh, based in Presswick. Um, and I am an aeronautical engineer, uh, fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Um, and I tell you that because I would like it to be clear to all of you that I understand perfectly um, your concerns um, about flying on helicopters, um, about the safety of helicopters. I have, <coughs> I think, uh, hydraulic fluid running through my veins, not uh, blood. Um, that's how much I am committed uh, to the aeronautical and the aerospace industry um, and how much I'm committed uh, to ensuring that these aircraft are safe for you and your colleagues to fly on and that you are convinced that these aircraft are safe for you to fly on. Um, I'm also here today, if I can make this, there we go. I'm here today with a colleague of mine, Gilles Brugnot. Gilles, a French colleague of mine, is the head of fleet safety um, in Eurocopter. Gilles is also a helicopter pilot, flight test engineer, um, who has uh, had a dedicated and long career uh, in the helicopter business. Our presentations this morning, there are two. I, I will speak to you for, uh, for about half an hour, and they're in two parts. I would just like to bring you, just remind some of the facts uh, around the event and also some of the details of the systems on the helicopter, because I, I understand that some of you in the room are not so familiar with, with what happened, what helicopters are, how they operate, the systems on board. Gilles will go into much more detail after the coffee break, um, with regard to the investigation and where we are with the details of the investigation. So, for the next 30 minutes, <coughs> there's the agenda. I'd like to give you a short introduction to Eurocopter, tell you a little bit about what happened, uh, a look at the, the gearbox itself. When I was here in November, um, some of you said to us, you know, we'd like to understand better how this shaft is manufactured. Um, so think about how you can show us the manufacturing of the shaft. As a consequence of those comments, we've made a film of how the shaft is manufactured. It's, uh, it's short, but it's, uh, I hope you'll find it very interesting, and we'll be showing you, I'll be showing you that film. A few words about the emergency lubrication system on the gearbox, so-called M-Lube um, system. Uh, the health monitoring system on the aircraft, uh, the HUMS as we call it, health and use usage monitoring system. And well, you've heard already about the safety advisors visit to Marignan, so not too many comments uh, about that. A few words, first of all, about Eurocopter. Um, Eurocopter is the world's largest helicopter manufacturer. We produced last year 500, we manufactured 500 um, helicopters and we delivered 500 helicopters um, to customers across the globe commercial helicopters, military uh, helicopters. Um, we have delivered and there are operating today more than 11,000 helicopters in, in service. Um, they have accumulated more than 80 million flight hours. A helicopter flies on average about 1,000 flight hours every year. So that means about 80,000 years of helicopter flying on the, the Eurocopter fleet. The company itself is staffed by a very dedicated um, team of people, a very large number of engineers. Um, we are a member of or a part of the European Aerospace Group, EADS, um, which is the world's largest aerospace company. Um, it manufactures Airbus aircraft, it manufactures Eurocopter helicopters, it manufactures um, Ariane spacecraft and Astrium satellites. Um, it has the largest 
base of aerospace capability in the world. There are more than 20,000 engineers working in EADS, so we have a very large pool of um, capability and competence to access. The Super Puma, well, we've delivered about 700 or more, I think, now, uh, uh, more than 700 Super Pumas to customers across the world. Some of those, of course, a very significant number of those, um, to the oil and gas sector, the helicopter is uh, the market leader. It's the most utilised helicopter in the oil and gas sector across the world. Um, and it has, until the recent event, had very uh, long um, uh, tradition of safe and reliable um, flight. There are about 200 machines affected by this incident, of the total 700 that have been delivered. About 200 are affected because they have what we call a second generation shaft uh, in the gearbox. Um, about 50% of those 200 are still flying um, with, with operators or military that have chosen to continue to fly and about 50% of the 200 are for the moment not flying and, and those that of course are the ones um, uh, in particular in the oil and gas business. Our priority and, and um, Alan has mentioned it is safety, is your safety, it's the safety of the passengers and the crew that fly on the aircraft. And those are not just words. Um, that is our declared corporate objective. Our number one corporate objective is safety, safety of the people that fly on our aircraft. It is a culture in our company, and I believe, Alan, you referred to it. I believe for those of you who visited last week, you saw it f firsthand. Um, it is the foundation of our success. Neither an aircraft nor a helicopter manufacturer can survive um, if it doesn't put safety as its number one priority, and there is no compromise um, to that principle. There are very significant tests underway. Uh, tens of thousands of man-hours um, have been invested and continue to be invested, and millions of euros um, in this issue since the first um, incident in May. Um, we're not doing this uh, behind closed doors. We're not doing it without the benefit of external advisors. Um, we have brought in um, a specialist engineering company, an external company, which has also been helping Airbus. You may have, some of you may be familiar with the incredible Airbus A380, the super jumbo double-decker aircraft, which has been produced by the European industry. Um, it has cracks in the wings, it has developed some cracks in the wings um, and Airbus engineers have um, invited a specialist company in to help them understand, uh, challenge them and Eurocopter has brought the same company, uh, it's called Shining, um, it sounds Chinese but it isn't, um, in to help us to understand the, uh, to, to challenge us on the investigation and in addition our customers, um, the operators of the helicopters, Bond, Bristow, CHC and others, have um, required an independent validation team from uh, Georgia Research Techni um, Technical Institute. Um, to, uh, they have nominated the, uh, the institute to be um, a validator for all of our investigation, for our tests and for our results and recommendations. Um, and that institute is working on behalf, not of Eurocopter, but on behalf of you and on behalf of uh, our customers um, as an independent validation, validation process. Georgia Tech, for those of you, I'm sure you, you would not, no, need, no reason why you would be fam familiar with it, but in my industry is considered to be the lead um, academic institute for, um, for research in aerospace materials, uh, and in aerospace, dynamic um, and static um, stress uh, and fatigue um, uh, understanding in the aerospace business. Um, a policy of open communication, it's been mentioned more than once and uh, it's real. Uh, and I think those of who visited last week will confirm. Um, we have a variety of briefings. Um, not just here, but, uh, but in, in other forums, including across the world. I have teams that are deployed in Asia, in um, Western Australia, in Brazil, uh, in, uh, in the United States, uh, to ensure that the aviation authorities, the operators, the passengers, the pilots um, are informed 
um, of what we're doing. We're deeply sorry for what's happened. Uh, we, are, uh, we understand the concerns of the passengers. Two ditchings is too, too many, that's clear. Um, and we know that our reputation is at stake. So clearly, um, you will decide when you are confident to get back on the aircraft. Um, it will be a joint decision of all stakeholders. Um, our job, I think my role, is to make sure that you've got the information that you need uh, in order to give you um, the opportunity to make an informed decision. What happened? Well, I think most of you know what happened. Two controlled ditchings uh, within six months after eight years of operation of the, uh, of the 225. 250,000 flight hours already flown on the, uh, the, the fleet. Uh, the vertical shaft inside the gearbox ruptured. Um, and uh, we'll have a look at that. And at the same time, um, the, uh, the requirement, that meant that the pilots had warnings in the cockpit um, that they had lost the lubrication, two lubrication pumps, um, which was supposed to pump the oil around the gearbox, had failed. The pilots were informed of that. The standard procedure is to um, illuminate the emergency lubrication system. There is a third system in the gearbox, which is an emergency system. Um, they did, um, and they were given a third warning that the lubrication system had failed. Um, in fact, it turned out that the system had not failed, but that the warning was, f they were falsely informed uh, that the system was not working. So there were in both, um, both incidents a false alarm of the lubrication system. The crew followed the procedure um, perfectly. Um, they brought the aircraft in both cases onto the water. The safety equipment uh, worked uh, as it was supposed to do uh, and happily uh, all the passengers and crew um, were able to get out of the aircraft safely into the life, uh, into the life rafts and were, uh, were evacuated. Um, after four million hours, four million of flight hours of the, the Super Puma, this was a totally unexpected uh, event, uh, one of course uh, which is not uh, designed for um, and, uh, and one which has caused uh, uh, inside Eurocopter, uh, a very important impact. This is what the gearbox looks like in a... You've seen uh, from, from Alan's picture. Um, this is a cutaway of the gearbox, and you can see the, the red uh, in the middle, in the heart of the gearbox, the red bevel gear and the vertical shaft, uh, the two pieces which are, which are welded together. They drive the bevel gear, turns the power from the engine, which you can see in this photo on the right-hand side. The, powers the power comes in from the two engines on the 225. They're turning, the two engines are turning at 23,000 revs per minute. Um, and the gearbox converts the power from the engines coming in horizontally into vertical power to the, to the rotors, to the rotor blades, which are turning at around 270 revs per minute. So you can see that it's not only converting the power, but it's also reducing the speed. Um, the rupture you can see is indicated where the blue line is. Um, the engine power continues to transmit through the bevel gear to the, um, to the rotor blades and the, the vital function, therefore, of the gearbox is, is maintained. But because the shaft broke, um, the lower part, the vertical shaft, is connected to the, main, uh, to the two um, uh, oil pumps and, therefore, the, uh, the oil pumps um, stopped. Uh, the lubrication of the gearbox stopped and at that moment the emergency lubrication system was then, um, was then uh, um, switched on. Um, the emergency lubrication system consists of a mix of air and glycol which is held in a special reservoir on board the aircraft. The glycol is mixed with the air and it's injected um, through special injectors onto the gears and it's, it's, it does that to cool the gearbox and by doing so um, uh, if there is a loss of gearbox oil, it's designed to allow the aircraft to continue flying for a, a further 30 minutes. Um, that's what the vertical shaft looks like uh, in practice. We saw a photograph earlier. We have one here with us, and at the coffee break, uh, it's in the box over there. We'll bring it out, and you'll be able to, to, to get a look at it a bit more closely. It's made of steel alloy. Um, it's the, the bevel gear itself, the gearing itself, is subject to a process that we call... Uh, nitriding, um, it's, a ni it's a nitrogen um, a surface hardening process um, and um, the second generation shaft is subject to a nitration process, the first generation, 
has a similar surface hardening process but using carbon rather than nitrogen uh, and that's really the difference between the first generation and the second generation shafts, a change of steel and a change of uh, surface welding process. So as I said, we were asked when we were here, or I was asked when I was here in November, to, to give a little bit of view on how this shaft is made. The manufacturing process for a shaft like this um, is five months long. To give you an idea of how much time and effort goes into the manufacturing, it starts as a blank, a steel blank coming out of a foundry, and then it's machined uh, and treated in our own facilities. It's, there's no supply chain here, it's manufactured by Eurocopter. Uh, and it's treated and checked um, and I have a short film and I would like to show you that film and show you exactly how the, uh, the manufacturing process works. So if we could run that film please. 